Hello, my name is Dr. Melissa McAllister, and I'm an assistant professor at Indiana State University in the Department of Social Work, and I'm also the executive director of the Pride Center of Terre Haute. It's an honor and pleasure to be here tonight to share with you my personal journey as a woman in leadership. In the beginning of my career, I spent my time working in residential treatment with adolescents that experienced behavioral difficulties and in school systems helping kids that struggled with emotional impacts. For about a decade, I trained potential child welfare workers with secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, and emotional intelligence. And in 2003, while I was pursuing my undergraduate degree in social work, I co-created the first LGBTQIA plus youth program in my hometown with my fellow colleague, Leah Davis. All these experiences shaped and inspired me to pursue my graduate and doctoral studies. I based my interest area on public service leadership and the importance of building authentic and genuine emotional relationships in macro practice social work especially in rural environments. This became a main component of my teaching philosophy that underpinned my career in academia. A theme that I saw emerge in my work time and time again related to this quote I had heard by the late great Dr. Maya Angelou. And she said, people will forget what you say, they will forget what you do, but they're never gonna forget the way you made them feel. And this wasn't the first time I had heard this message. It was something that resonated deeply with me and was instilled in me as a child. And that's how important using and regulating your emotions really are. My dad once told me that emotions were both my greatest strength and my greatest challenge, and how I handled them would determine my character and success in life. I have a history of preachers in my family, namely my grandpa Engel, who was a Southern Baptist deacon. And if I re related to anyone most in my family, it would be him. Spiritually, I spent my childhood loving stories of Jesus and trying to practice what it meant to truly have compassion for humanity, even in the face of adversity. I was told once by my grandpa that we had Native American ancestry, and as a child, this fascinated me. I was obsessed with symbols, books, and the history of art, and trying to figure out what our ancestors really wanted us to know. I was actually an art major at first before anything else, and I remember I could sit for hours by myself in my sketches in deep contemplation of the world mysteries, and I would stare at these black and white pictures of my grandparents and try to imagine what it was like to live during their time. I used to ask myself, what is life really about? What's the point? As a young teenager, I would sometimes climb up on top of my roof at night and look up at the cosmos, and I would see a billions of stars in the sky, and I would rate relate that to like how many billions of people there are in the world and I wondered what is it all for? Why are we here and who do we belong to? I thought about how we come into this world alone and how we leave alone so there must be some divine reason why we're here together to love one another. How you feel at the core of your being is important to forming your identity. Who you are in part comes from where you feel like you belong. I belong to two loving parents, Roy and Nancy, who met in high school. And I'm the granddaughter of Russell and Lula, who were married for 61 years. I'm also the proud aunt of five. And if you ask her, I am the uh, spoiled baby sister of Teresa Lynn. Our life wasn't always easy, and we struggled like most families do, but we always had love for each other. And last but not least, I am the loving partner of my beloved Darlene. These people are my family. They are where I belong, and each one of them shaped the heart of who I am today. As a child and today, as a 45-year-old gay woman, I have always, always seen things from this larger point of view, very holistic. I dream big, and this is something that I kind of learned from my mom. She said, you can be anything you want to be if you put your mind to it. She called me then and she still calls me now her star. And in looking at this picture of my, my family uh, tree, you can see that this dream big perspective may have came from her. This is something that I learned from my family about how to look at a situation. My ancestors were very spiritual uh, human beings and their perspective of the world, the way they viewed connection and unity um, is very symbolic of the rings of a tree. One specific tree that comes to mind is in the oldest books in history, and that is the sycamore tree. 
In the Bible, Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore tree to watch Jesus pass by. And in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, two sycamore trees are represented as the tree of heaven and the tree of earth. This represents divinity and how we see things from above so that we can connect. In 2019, I moved to Terre Haute, Indiana, away from my family, away from where I belong, so that I could pursue my dreams as an assistant professor at Indiana State University in the Department of Social Work. And I would never know that this sycamore tree would have the most profound impact on my life to date. For Indiana, the vast majority of LGBTQIA high school students surveyed in 2017 by the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network regularly heard anti-LGBTQIA plus remarks. In fact, 92% heard that's so gay, 86% dyke and fag, 85% negative remarks about gender expression, 75% negative remarks about transgender, 42% had heard regular um, remarks by school staff that were homophobic, and 21% heard negative remarks about someone's gender expression. Only 2% of these high school students reported receiving LGBTQ plus inclusive sex ed at their school. Only 6% had a policy to support transgender or gender nonconforming students. Only 7% attended a school with a comprehensive anti-bullying harassment policy. And only 13% were taught positive representations of LGBTQ people in history and our events. In 2019, the Human Rights Campaign Municipal Equality Index rated a total of 506 cities on 49 different variables for LGBTQIA plus inclusion from every state in this nation. HRC listed Terre Haute, Indiana, a 42 out of a possible 100. This index measures how inclusive municipal laws, policies, and services are of LGBTQIA plus people who live and work there. Cities are rated based on non-discrimination laws, the municipality as an employer, municipal services, law enforcement, and the city's leadership public position on equality. I first heard this information during my first year here at ISU when three of my undergraduate social work students, Jerem Hawker, Martina Hall, and Jordan Zeller, brought it to my attention during their field internship in spring of 2020. I was in a leadership position as their field instructor, and I remember feeling outraged and heartbroken over the lack of services for LGBTQIA plus youth in this community. What these students did and they accomplished in one semester changed the course of history here in Terre Haute, Indiana, and the future of every youth that identifies as LGBTQIA plus in this community. They called their internship Project Affirm, Beyond the Rainbow, and they focused their work on LGBTQIA plus advocacy in rural environments. Their initial field work and community advocacy would later go on to help develop the very first Pride Center of Terre Haute. In my role with these three students, four important lessons emerged that I would like to share with you about how to help identify and develop leaders. The first one is you must build authentic, genuine, and transformational relationships. I, be, I believe people are not transaction. They're not goods and services that we trade for favors. I try my best to honor people's ideology, culture, their story, their lived experiences. I try to meet people where they're at, and I don't expect them to be something that they're not. I look for a way to create a genuine connection because authenticity and genuineness in human relationships are at the core of my work in social work. They are the most important aspect of our practice, and I try not to ever forget how important it is to build trust and engage in these relationships first. My engagement skills will always determine how open and honest people will be with me. So I work on building emotional intelligence skills and becoming a strong, healthy vessel. Without the necessary time and energy devoted to this first step, my work means nothing. Number two, focus on the process over the outcome. I have learned that the process of becoming can never be bypassed for a quick fix. This is exploitive of nature. I've learned to allow time for things to organically evolve. 
I try not to pursue rewards directly, and I trust that they will come by adhering to my ethical values. I focus on the process with diligence and effortful study, and I let the outcome kind of take care of itself. I try not to worry about what others will think of my performance, and I view each attempt as merely practice for the next attempt. I'm really not afraid of failure or to make mistakes because I'm willing to take risks. Number three, I try to determine who has the least amount of power. Becoming a strong advocate and leader for change, I've learned to ask myself, whose voices can I help to elevate? If I speak out, will it allow others to come forward? Or if by speaking out, have I oppressed someone else's voice that had limited power? Being in leadership is never easy. I take my privilege seriously. It's hard to understand how to navigate ethical dilemmas when no matter what choice you make, there might be a conflict. I take a moment to ask myself if I'm in line with my ancestors, with my identity, and my values. Number four, sustainable change comes by amplifying the voices of others and elevating them. I believe the best leaders are the ones you can't always identify because they elevate others to become leaders. When trying to help lead a group or a community, I've found that my conceptual approach to leadership is based on what's called a relational cultural theory. It's a subjective inductive approach which is rooted in the bottom up rather than top down process to decision making. I will rarely provide answers to questions because I prefer to lead others to their own discovery of the answers they seek. I provide more of a guidance through a theoretical model and a value system of ethics rather than make decisions. A term that I've heard in social work used often is called empowerment, which is a term that I don't really prefer to use because it implies that I have power and I'm gonna share it. This to me is oppressive in nature. It is also paternalistic by assuming my knowledge will somehow enlighten someone else. I try to remember and to respect another's process and worldview by first asking if I can share my thoughts with them. Therefore, I feel like my role is only to help people reveal the power they already have inside of them and help guide them to the knowledge that they are seeking. Keeping with my identity and my true artistic nature, I examine human behavior from a holistic, cyclical perspective like my ancestors did before me. Always looking for these similarities and these, theme, uh, these themes that are observed in nature. In my leadership role, I relate most with the honeybee, not only because my name literally means honeybee, but because the bee is one of the most important creatures on earth, if not the most important. My father named me Melissa Kay, my middle name after his sister Judy. Melissa means honeybee, and Kay means the keeper of the keys. This is a metaphor to describe the triple goddess Hecate and her power as the great mediator between humans and a deeper world. My name reminds me to always be in service to the community, just like the bee, and to provide balance. I value the process of becoming or building what's called the beloved community. And it can never be bypassed for a quick fix. This is too exploitive of nature. It's more important for me to foster real, authentic, and genuine relationships and allow time for things to organically evolve. I have learned over my years as a macro practice social worker devoted to community capacity building that to be a true advocate, you must meet people first where they're at and honor their ideology and worldview. You must help to elevate people's voices rather than empower them because to empower suggests that you have power and you're giving it to someone else. I am more helping others to see their own power, helping to reveal it to them and assisting them in elevating their own voice to advocate for themselves. I also believe in fostering relationships that are transform, uh, transformative rather than transactional. This means that I focus on building relationships with others that are beyond an exchange of service or performative, but built on authentic and genuine care for each other 
as people that foster a love of all humanity because we all as human beings are more important than programs. I learned these lessons from my ancestors that focused on a power that was higher than themselves, a perspective that was more holistic and cyclical, a relational cu cultural subjective inductive approach to learning and leading that uses courage, compassion, and character. My role as leading these three students, Jerem, Martina, and Jordan, was to identify and amplify their voices that are often silenced and to help elevate them as leaders through care and compassion for who and what they bring to the table to a beloved community. I have learned exactly what my ancestors always knew, what Dr. Maya Angelou said, and that is people will forget what you say, they will forget what you do, but they're never gonna forget how you made them feel. And in this message, I learned that to be a good leader, I must always remember that we come into this world alone, we leave alone, the most important thing we can do is to make others feel like their lives matter, that relationships matter, and that we are dearly loved. Thank you. <laughs>